Come, let's stand together out of reverence for the Lord whose word we will now hear. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, and I'm reading in the English Standard Version. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this scripture. We thank you for the inspiration of, of your Holy Spirit. Spirit, we thank you for this word. We thank you that through the pen of Paul, you have given this scripture of Ephesians for us as a church thousands of years later. And we ask that today, this afternoon, as it is preached and taught, Lord, that you would be in this. That you would take what is true and make it stick and what is not accurate, what is only my opinion, would you let that be lost? But Lord, would you apply your word to our hearts in such a way that your church grows in health because of it? Would you feed us, O great shepherd of the sheep? Feed us. We need you this afternoon. We depend upon you, upon your grace. And so we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. And as we come back to our sermon series in the book of Ephesians this afternoon, uh, we are going to be looking at this passage in two sections. This is a long passage of scripture, verses 7 through 16. Part 1 will be this Sunday and part 2 next Sunday, uh, but you'll see later on why I, I, it's one unit of scripture divided into two Sundays worth of sermons. The title of the sermon this afternoon is, Why the Lord Gave You the Grace You Received. Why the Lord Gave You the Grace You Received. There was a Canadian man, uh, I believe he was from Trois-Rivières, Quebec, and uh, he decided he hired a company to jack up his house, to put it on, you know, stilts or, or whatever we call those things, and to take out the old foundation that was crumbling and, and disintegrating under the house and to replace it with a new solid foundation. And the benefit of this would be obvious that not only would the structural uh, integrity of the house be greatly improved, but also the, the basement would be more useful to them as a family. And interestingly, this story made the newspaper in Hartford, Connecticut. Not because a man decided to improve his foundation, but because after it was finished, the owner walked through the house and uh, he said to the builder, to the contractor, where are the stairs? And the contractor's reply was that the stairs had not been included in the contract. There were no stairs to the basement. And I guess that's a lesson learned. And so this article ran with this story along with a number of other lessons. And this was really the point of the article was about how the Canadian government, at least in Quebec, was supporting homeowners in uh, replacing faulty uh, concrete basements, faulty foundations in many homes and helping them build proper foundations. 
And in this article, it was actually quite positive. It, it said these are many lessons we should be learning in Hartford, Connecticut from Canada. How often do you hear that in the news? Lessons Americans think they should be learning from Canadians. I think there should be a book written collecting all the such stories and we would celebrate it on Canada Day. But the end of the article said, Canada can show Connecticut what pitfalls to avoid, not the least of which is to make sure that stairs are included in your contract, but it says, in repairing lives as well as homes, we need to listen to our neighbor, said the newspaper in Hartford, Connecticut. Well, at the end of Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul compares the church to a building whose strength is found in the foundation upon which it rests. Look with me at the end of chapter 2 in verses 20 through 22, saying that the household of God is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. What Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus has some important lessons that we need to listen to. Today we are coming back to this series of sermons in the book of Ephesians and we're picking up at chapter 4 verse 7. But I want you to remember that Paul has just been talking about the unity of the church. What is it in the previous passage, in the first seven, six verses of chapter 4, that unites us? He's developing that theme even that we just saw back in chapter 2, at the end of chapter 2. That there is a strength that unites us and binds us together and joins us together as a church. That unity that we have, the, the strength and structural integrity that every, ch every church has is in Christ Jesus. Our, our, our unity is grounded in the first six, six verses of chapter 4 in the truth of the reality of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's grounded in the gospel of our triune God and that then Paul urges the Ephesians, he strongly urges the Ephesians to maintain that unity that they have which is in Christ. To protect that bond that they have as a church. So if there's weakness in the local church, if there's a lack of structural integrity, if there's a lack of unity, do we blame it on the foundation and say our foundation's crumbling? We need to hire a contractor to come in and tear out the old foundation and give us a new foundation. If we are weak as a church, is it the fault of the foundation? What does Ephesians 2 say in verse 20? That we are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. There is no problem with our foundation. We don't need to start over again and rebuild. Today, in this passage, uh, stopping at verse 12, looking at verse, verses 7 through verse 12 of chapter 4, verse 7 through verse 12, Paul outlines three gifts, three gifts that the Lord has given to make his people one, that also prepare you to do your part in strengthening the church. We see here that Paul shows us three gifts the Lord has given to make his people one, that also shows you what your part is to make a stronger church. The Lord makes sure the church will grow in unity by giving sovereign grace, by giving gifted leaders, and by giving equipped members. And this is going to be the first of two parts. Next week we'll look mainly at verses 12 through 16. But first, before we dive in this afternoon, let me uh, help, stop a minute and just take a look at the way that Paul outlines this passage, the way Paul structures this passage together. In verse 7, you'll see that he begins 
with a reference to all the individual members of the church. He, he refers in a, in a very brief way to every single person sitting in the pew, or in this case, watching the live stream, every single person who's a part of the church. Grace was given to each one, he says in the beginning of verse 7. To each one, grace was given. He doesn't draw attention yet to, to where the grace came from. He's drawing attention to who received the grace. He puts it in a passive voice here. To each one, grace was given. And he doesn't even tell us where it comes from until the end of the sentence, where he begins to unveil that truth. He's emphasizing the individuals in the church who received grace. Which individuals in the church received grace? Each one. And that's how he ends the passage, too, in verse 16. He's again talking about every individual member, when they are working properly, when each is doing its part. The way the beginning and the end then focus, they're, they're like two bookends or brackets, both focusing on the, the each and every member. Each member received grace. Each member does its part when it's functioning properly, when it's working properly. The way Paul shows us these things, he it helps us to see what Paul's driving at with these brackets, these bookends, focusing on each member at the beginning and end of this passage. It's about what each believer in the Ephesian church received from Christ and therefore what each member must be doing with what he or she received. It spells out for us that when the church as a whole isn't functioning well, the fault does not lie with Christ. The fault does not lie with the foundation. We don't need to rebuild and start over again. The problem is not also, it's also, it's also not with what Christ gave us. There's not a shortage of grace. The problem is, again, with what we are doing, with what we have received. Isn't that funny? Verse 7 begins in the passive voice, talking passively about what each member has received, but verse 7 doesn't let us stay passive. Verse 7 does not let any member of the church, any believer, any Christian, stay passive. There is no, pa there is no such thing as a passive member of the body of Christ. Not in Paul's thinking, not in Ephesians chapter 2, not in the Bible. You know, these days, movies and video games uh, often begin with a warning about flashing lights or about the content of the movie or video game and what you're about to see. Let me give you a warning before we go any further. Let me, let me give you a chance to turn off the screen, to turn off the TV, to turn off the computer, to turn off your phone, whatever you're watching this sermon on. Let me give you a fair warning and a chance to turn it off right now. If you want a sermon that lets you off the hook, this isn't it. If you want to keep on blaming, your, blaming what's wrong with the church on everybody else, I advise you to turn it off right now. That's your warning. We see here the first gift Paul shows us that Christ gave to make his people one is found in verses 7 through 10. Look with me at those verses, chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. So the first point, the first gift that Paul shows us is that Christ gave sovereign grace. Christ gave sovereign grace. From the very first words of verse 7. There's no escaping the responsibility that every believer has in the local church. Look at the very beginning of verse 7. 
but grace was given to each one. To each one of us. Maybe you've been in church services before where, where the pastor was sort of addressing specific sins in the, in the church. Not naming names, but you knew people were looking around to see who he might be talking about. I'd like to do that right now. So sitting at home, why don't you go and grab a mirror and bring the mirror and put it right in front of where you're sitting. And then you can look around and you can see who the pastor might be talking about. To each one of us, grace was given. The passive voice of this verb isn't going to let you remain passive. Christ gave us sovereign grace. And there are two reasons here why I'm saying that he, what the grace he gave us is sovereign grace. First, because although verse 7 just says grace was given, verse 8 tells us clearly who gave this grace to each one of us? Christ. When he ascended on high, that's when he gave us this grace. That's the one who gave us this grace. This is the Christ, the ascended, high and mighty Christ who gave us this grace. The Lord Most High. El Elyon, the Hebrew says in the Bible. God Most High. And we here call him Christ the Lord, who is the Ascended One. And that's the point Paul makes when he says, Therefore it says, in verse 8, Therefore it says, and then he quotes Psalm 68, verse 18. And the original psalm is interesting. If you look this up, it doesn't quite say that what Paul says it says here. See, Paul's not just quoting the psalm. He's expositing the psalm. He's preaching from the psalm. He's applying this psalm to Christ. The original psalm applies this victory about the ascension and the, the, the victory and the, the, the king giving gifts, rather receiving gifts. The original song apl applies this to God when he moved his abode from Mount Sinai to Mount Zion, from the wilderness to Jerusalem, establishing Zion as a kingdom where God would be worshipped, where he would receive the worship of his people. And Paul's now reinterpreting that psalm in light of the gospel. He's showing us that now he's gone one step further. God's now made Christ the king. God's moved Christ from the, being the, the ruler of Zion, the one who's worshipped in Zion only, and now he's worshipped by the nations. He's no longer just the king of Jerusalem. He's the king of the world. He's no longer just the savior of Israel. He's the savior of the church. Christ is king. Heaven is his throne. The church is his people. And instead of receiving gifts, he gives them. He gives them. The king is our sovereign, and his grace is therefore sovereign grace. The second reason I say this is sovereign grace is because the king decides what he's going to give to his people. The people don't demand the gifts from their king. The king gives them out of his generosity. It's his decision. It's his will. It's his generosity, his kindness. He's not obligated. He's not unfair in what he gives. And he's never stingy. Jesus is never stingy. He's never cheap. But you might not know that from the way we sometimes complain about his gifts, right? You think it's not fair that some people are so gifted and you aren't. You think it's not fair what God has provided for the means and the well-being and the livelihood of some people, but not you. You think it's not fair the way some people enjoy a certain kind of household that you could only dream of. You look over at your neighbor's grass and you think it's so green. Meanwhile, he's looking at yours thinking the same thing. And you complain to God about what he's given you. You say, I could be content if only you would give me what, some of what you gave them. Give me some of that, Lord, and then I would learn to be content. Content. 
And in your more spiritual moments, perhaps you say, well, I know I'm in a hardship right now, but God is withholding this grace from me that he gave to so-and-so. He's withholding that grace from me in order to teach me a deep spiritual lesson. No. No. There is no shortage of grace that God has given to you. Verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us. This is sovereign grace. It says grace was given, past tense. You notice that? This isn't talking about grace that God still always gives. This is making a past statement true. This is grace that God has given, that he gave. And then he says it was according, this is still in verse 7, it was according to the measure of Christ's gift. Sovereign grace. The Lord Jesus Christ measured each gift. This isn't like what my mom used to say to all of us. I have a twin brother and three older sisters. And my mom used to always say to us on Christmas, I spent the same on each of you. Christ measured each gift. Some individuals have greater wealth. Some individuals have more profound or more impressive gifts. Some people are more gifted than other people. This is true. But there is no shortage of grace in Christ Jesus. These are sovereign gifts because this is sovereign grace. The Lord Jesus measured each gift. Wouldn't that mean that what he gave you is enough? The Lord Jesus Christ appointed each gift. The Lord Jesus Christ chose the gifts he gave and to whom he would give them. And they are not your due. They are not what you deserve. These are not your rights. He gave grace. Sufficient, sovereign grace. I love this theme in scripture. It might be my favorite theme in the whole Bible. The way grace runs to, through the whole scripture, through the whole word of God. In the New Testament, the word charis for grace is used, I think it's 155 times in the New Testament. It's all the way through the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word chesed is used 255 times. Whatever 255 is plus 155, that's the number of times grace is mentioned throughout the whole Bible. And I'm clearly not good at math. That's not one of my gifts. But his grace is enough. Loving kindness. Steadfast love. Generosity. Grace. But let me ask you this question. Do you think his grace is enough? That when Christ gives you grace, that what he gave you is sufficient? Do you think so? Do you say so with your mouth? but don't really believe it in your heart. Do you know it's the right thing that Christians are supposed to say that? Of course the answer is yes, Christ gave enough grace. But in your heart, do you really believe that today? Have you forgotten that according to Romans chapter 10, being a Christian is about confessing with your mouth what is true in your heart. Romans 10 says, For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Will not be put to shame. Do you believe Christ has put you to shame? The scripture goes on and says, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. 
For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, Paul says in Romans 10, verses 10 through 13. The single greatest, most real reality, I don't think that's even proper English, but the most real reality on which rests not only the unity of this and every other church, but the very existence of the church itself, that ultimate reality, that ultimate cause, is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Earlier, Paul said that the immeasurable greatness of God's power toward us who believe is according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Christ is Lord above all now and forever. Period. When Paul pauses, then in verse 9 and 10, to explain and apply Psalm 68, verse 18, he points out that the same Lord who ascended in victory was first the God who descended in humility. Before Christ was enthroned, he was incarnated. The God-man. God became man. He who came and lived and died for us is now the one who gives us all things. Each one of us has received his grace. Each one of us who are his people, his followers, believers in him, Christians. The next verse in Psalm 68, verse 19, the very next verse after the one Paul quotes or, or teaches on here, says, Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. Do you think that grace is enough? This means that if you aren't trusting that his grace is enough for you today and tomorrow and throughout all the days of 2021, no matter what comes, if you aren't trusting that his grace is enough, then it means you aren't believing that he is Lord. If you're complaining about what you lack, Instead of rejoicing about what your Lord has given you, repent. Repent. Repent and believe. I had to this week. As I looked at this and thought about my own grievances and my own pettiness and my own small faith, I had to repent. You need to do the same. You have a part to play. You have a role to play in the church of the Lord. Didn't our Lord say, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. Matthew 28. Didn't he command us to teach every disciple to obey all the things that he taught? Doesn't that obedience start with us? Didn't he also promise, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Did you forget? I did too. And if so, what should we do in light of verses 7 through 10? You need spiritual R and R. Spiritual R and R. You need to remember your Lord. And you need to rely on his grace. He gave you grace. He gave you sovereign, sovereign grace. The second thing Paul shows us here that Christ the Lord gave to make his people one is he gave gifted leaders. Christ gave gifted leaders. Look at verse 11. 
And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. Sometimes people get caught up in these roles, these offices that are described here and misunderstand them. I was one time sitting in a ministerial gathering, a gathering of pastors in another place. And one pastor asked me, do you believe in the fivefold ministry? I had no idea what he was talking about. I, I had never heard that before. It mattered to him. So I asked, what, what is the fivefold ministry? And I think he thought, what are you doing here sitting among pastors? And he might have been right. But sometimes people miss the point that's described here. They miss the point that verse 11 is making. As some translations make it clear, it does not say he gives apostles and so on. It says he himself gave. Christ himself gave. The point is that Christ the Lord gave us gifted leaders. Specifically gifted leaders. Specifically called leaders. Specifically chosen leaders. And this is not vague. This is specific. He says, it says in the Greek, he gave the apostles. Each one of these groups, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, each one of these is introduced with the word the. This is specific, not general, not vague, not ambiguous. Christ gave the apostles. When verse 7 stated that each one of us has received grace from God, that he gave us grace to each one of us, Verse 11 now specifies that among the grace each one of us has received is these gifted leaders. It does not just say here that Paul or that God gave spiritual gifts to us. He's saying he gave people to us. Among his gifts for the church that he had given are people. The apostles Christ gave. They were a sovereign gift from Christ to his church. So who were the apostles? Mark 3, verse 13 through 19 says, And Jesus went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him. And he appointed twelve whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to him whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to him whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. In Acts chapter 1, just after Jesus had ascended, the very event that Paul is referring, Psalm 68 verse 18 to, the ascension of Christ, just after that, the 11 apostles, 11 remaining apostles were gathered together with other followers of Jesus Christ and they were devoting themselves to pray. And Peter said, we need to choose another apostle. We need to appoint another one to take Judas's place. And they chose Matthias to replace Judas. Because to be an apostle, Peter made it very clear, to be an apostle, he had to be one of the men who have accompanied us during all that time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us. One of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. Acts chapter 1 verses 21 and 22. And then, as Paul later says, it was almost like an afterthought, almost like one untimely born. Along came Paul. Christ appeared to Paul and chose him personally and specifically to be an apostle to the nations, to the Gentiles, as Paul confirms in 1 Corinthians 9 and 1 Corinthians 15. Together they were personally chosen, the apostles, for the specific office, for the specific purpose, for the specific role, role of founding the early Christian movement that we call the church. Christ also gave the prophets. That's the next grouping in verse 11. First he gave the apostles, then he gave the prophets. This isn't a question about the timing. This is just the priority in which Paul lists them. New Testament scholar D.A. Carson explains that these are the same apostles and prophets Paul referred to as the foundation of the church in Ephesians 2 verse 20. We just read that a few minutes ago. 
The foundation is now the apostles and prophets of the first century church because they are the first to proclaim the gospel. The message they preach are the very words of God revealed to them by the Spirit. The same apostles and prophets in chapter 3 verse 5 of Ephesians to whom the mystery of Christ, Paul says, has now been revealed by the Spirit. Ephesians 3 verse 5 said, the mystery of Christ has now been revealed to the apostles and the prophets. And Carson explains that this phrase, apostles and prophets, in Ephesians 2.20, in Ephesians 3 verse 5, and now in Ephesians 4 verse 11, refers to people in the New Testament era. The prophets supplemented the ministry of the apostles. The apostles were given unique authority as the spokesmen of Jesus Christ, unique authority as the personal eyewitnesses he handpicked for their ministry. The prophets came along to supplement, and they came under the authority of the apostles, and they spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance, as the Spirit gave them a message for the church, and they spoke what the Spirit said to speak from time to time. The apostles were always apostles. The prophets prophesied when the Holy Spirit led them to prophesy. So Charles Hodge said, everyone who spoke by inspiration was a prophet. That is, whenever the Holy Spirit inspired someone to speak, he or she was a prophet. So how are these apostles and prophets a gift to you and me? How is it that when Paul says in verse 7, each of us has received grace, grace was given to each one of us, that now he explains that among that grace that was given to us is these apostles and prophets. How did we benefit from the apostles and prophets? How are they a gift to us? The New Testament scriptures that we hold in our hands, these precious writings, they're everything to us. These New Testament richer scriptures which explain and apply and reveal the fullness of God's plan begun in the First Testament. These New Testament scriptures, the Bible, containing the gospel, the very words of life. We would not have these if it were not for the gift Christ gave in the apostles and the prophets. Whenever a man sat down and put pen to paper or papyrus under the influence and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he was prophesying. Many of them were apostles who wrote the New Testament documents. Some were not apostles, but they were under the apostles and they were prophets. The Spirit was speaking through. And their ministry is preserved for us in this Bible that we depend on every day. The word of life that we follow, which feeds us and nourishes us. And from where we find eternal life as the gospel is made clear to us, praise the Lord. And then Paul lists two more gifts of people in verse 11. Uniquely gifted leaders that Christ gave as gifts to his church to each one of us. First he gave the evangelists and then it says he gave the shepherds and teachers and groups that unit together with one word, the, the shepherds and teachers. The word for gospel in Greek is the word evangelion. Evangel I'm not quite pronouncing it properly, but that's the way we traditionally pronounce it. Evangelion, literally good news. The word evangelist comes from that word. It means someone who preaches the good news. In Acts chapter 6, the first man ever named as a deacon is Stephen, who was an evangelist and who became the first martyr. Another deacon, coincidentally, named Philip in Acts chapter 8, also evangelized. And in Acts chapter 21, verse 8, is called the evangelist. In Paul's second letter to Timothy, he tells Timothy to do the work of an evangelist in 2 Timothy 4, verse 5. Evangelists preach the good news. Evangelists spread the good news to places it hasn't been before. The spreading of the gospel relies on the foundation laid by the New Testament, apostles and prophets, and then it's delivered to new places by the evangelists as the building builds upon the foundation already set. The church grows. And finally, Christ gave pastors and teachers. 
in verse 11. The word pastor is literally the word shepherd in Greek. Dr. Merkel points out that this is the only verse in the entire New Testament where any office, any person holding an office is ever called a pastor. We ought to learn something from that. This is one of the reasons why in Beacon Church I continually persist, annoying some of you, but I continue to insist on calling myself not Pastor Joe or Pastor Joe Haynes or something la da like that, but I'm simply one of the elders here. I'm, I'm the preaching elder at the church. Pastor is used one time as, a, as a, a function of an office in the New Testament, and this is that passage. It's literally the word shepherd. Elsewhere, it's the elders or overseers of the churches who are told to shepherd or who are told to pastor the flock. The elders and the overseers are the ones entrusted with that ministry of pastoring, of shepherding the flock of God that is among you. Again, as Dr. Merkel says, all elders must shepherd and teach, but not all teachers are elders. There are other teachers too. So Paul says here, pastors and teachers. Not presuming that every one of those is an elder. Every one of the pastors for sure, but not every teacher is an elder. And what do they teach? I think that's the bigger point. What do pastors feed their sheep and what do teachers teach their students? The word of God. That's the theme that runs through apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers. The word of God. They are ministers of the word of God. They are ministers of the word that God entrusted to them for the benefit of the church. It's not their word, it's his word. And they are only faithful in his, insofar as they teach the words that he has given. In Titus 1 verse 7, Paul calls them God's stewards. And then says, every elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Titus 1 verse 9. In Acts chapter 20 verse 28, Paul told all the overseers in the city of Ephesus when they gathered to meet him, he told them to watch over the flock like shepherds. Watch over them like shepherds. Protect them. In 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2, all elders are commanded to shepherd or to pastor the flock of God among them. 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 outline some of the qualifications for what makes a man qualified and ready to be one of these elders, to pastor and to teach. Paul tells Timothy that elders who specifically work in preaching and teaching are worthy of double honor. 1 Timothy 5 verse 12. Christ gave the local leaders that we call elders or overseers to pastor and teach the flock of God that is among them. To teach the local congregations of churches, of believers, wherever churches are planted, to teach the word of God to them. To shepherd them according to the word of God. To discipline them according to the word of God. To protect them from false doctrine, according to the word of God. But the church was already founded by the apostles and the prophets. There, that was the beginning. The foundation had already been laid. You don't need a new foundation when the building's nearly finished 2,000 years later. You don't need to go back and start over again and find new apostles and new prophets to give us some new word from God. We are not poorer today for lack of apostles. We are rich. We are rich in the legacy of faithful pastors and teachers who generation after generation after generation, century after century, have taught and preached and written on and exposited and expounded and commented on the word of the apostles and prophets that Christ gave to the church. We are not rich or we are not poor. We are rich. If you are lacking and starving for want of God's word, 
It is not because God has not spoken. It is because you have neglected the pastors and teachers who still teach the word Christ gave. Christ gave sovereign grace to each one of us. Christ gave, secondly, gifted leaders. And thirdly, to make his people one, Christ gave equipped members. Look at verse 12. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. To equip the saints for the work of the... Did Paul get that right, do you think? Should we scratch that out and say, no, 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 no. The pastors and teachers do the work of the ministry and they do it to serve the saints. Whenever I read this word, equip... In verse 12, it puts a certain heaviness in my heart. What a responsibility to be called to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. It was almost exactly eight years ago that we held our, our first gathering of friends in our living room to pray and to begin the work of planting Beacon Church. Almost exactly eight years ago. And from day one, I can tell you, and no one knows this better than I do. I sound like Donald Trump there, but really it's true. No one knows this better than I do. That from day one, some of the glaring weaknesses in this church were obvious reflections of my own shortcomings and weaknesses. I say that with a heavy heart. And so it's with humility of spirit that I'm asking that you would consider this this afternoon. I am more aware of you, more aware than you of my own weaknesses and the ways my weaknesses contribute to the weakness that is in Beacon Church. I know it better than you do. But I'm asking you to remember and to realize this church is no longer a gathering of a dozen people in my living room. This church is no longer just a vision or an idea that I was trying to, you know, infect other people with. To talk about the church that God could build in James Bay in Victoria and to grow a new church in this city. This church is more than a dream. It's more than an idea. It's more than a concept or a group of people in our living room now. It's a body of believers. The body has grown and it's a body of believers that spans greater Victoria now. There is so much that is good and wonderful about this little church that God has grown over the last eight years. But it's not all good, is it? And therefore, as we look around Beacon Church, as you, you look around to see the other members sitting around you today, and we can see what's missing and we can see some things that are wrong and we can see there are some things that aren't happening that should be happening and some things that could be better. And I ask you to consider humbly, I ask you to consider whether you might be part of the problem. The grace the Lord has given to each one of us, to each one of us, is explained first by Paul as the gift of those leaders who founded the church in the first century and who, who spread the good news as evangelists and who appointed in every local church shepherds and pastors, shepherds and teachers to teach the flock. Second, Paul explains that grace the Lord has given to the church, to each one of us in verse 12, explaining that this gift of gifted leaders was not to do the work of ministry for you, but to equip you for the work of the ministry to others. Do you see that? Verse 12 is carrying on from verse 7. That grace was given to each one of us. And in verse 12, that you are meant to be a gift to others. He gave you the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers to prepare you for the ministry to do 
your part in making the church strong and building the church and doing what he has equipped and gifted you specifically to do for others. To do your work of ministry, your part in making this a better church than it is today. A healthier church than it is today. A stronger church than it is today. A more mature church than it is today. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Maturity. Strength. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to see that what is lacking in the church is not because we've failed. It's not because we've done it all wrong. It's because we are still immature as a church. We still have growing to do. Praise God for his mercy and grace and compassion, for his patience with us. We've got a long way yet to go. Jesus isn't finished with us, though. His grace is still enough as it was at the beginning. He's still doing the same miracle in the church today that he began 2,000 years ago in the early church. We are not lacking anything. We are not wandering away from him in new paths. We are building on the same foundation he already laid in the apostles and prophets. We are not deviating from course. We're just a little slow. He's not finished with you. The task of, of building and growing Beacon Church to maturity doesn't just fall on the elders of the church, much less myself. It's a sacred duty that we each share together as one body knit together with joints and ligaments and sinews, but Christ Jesus being the cornerstone. It's a work that we share, a sacred calling that each of us has received when we received grace. It's a ministry all believers share as we are called to take responsibility for each other. It's a ministry for which we are equipped by the foundation that we have in the scriptures, laid down by the apostles and prophets that Jesus gave to us, equipped by this foundation for the spread of the gospel as it was preached from generation to generation to generation and still is. And by the gracious gift of the Lord to this flock of elders. Elders who love you. Who eagerly seek to equip you with biblical teaching and discipling. We have a good team of elders. The finest I've ever worked with, I might say. Pastors are not professionals you hire to do the work of the church. Pastors are preparers. They're preparers who prepare you. Elders are preparers who prepare you for the work that Christ has called you to. You are the people that Christ has given to one another. This third and great gift in this passage. Christ gave equipped members to serve one another, to strengthen one another, to support one another. You're not called simply to go to church. That is not a biblical Christian concept. You are not called to go to church. You are called to be the church. Will you answer the call? Let's pray. Father, we need you so much. We're like a dry and parched land, hungry for the rain. We're hungry for the word that would fall on us and bear fruit. We ask, Lord, that you would provide this grace again and again and again. In so many ways through the life of Beacon Church that you would keep us faithful to your word as we preach on Sundays, but also as we teach during the week. 
in many ways that not only the elders but other teachers called by you and gifted as teachers would rise up in Beacon Church and do the work of the ministry, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry that our church would flourish and blossom and bear fruit in a thousand different ways. That we would have members who call on one another, who support one another, who cry with one another, who, who are quick to pray with each other who encourage and support and strengthen, who hold each other accountable for their sin and say, brother, I'm so concerned about you. Come back to the truth. Repent from your sin. I care about you, brother. Members who would sacrifice their convenience, their time, their money for the sake of the needs of others in the church. Members who would be family with one another in a way that brings honor to the Holy Spirit whose temple we are growing to become. Father, would you do this great work, the New Testament work of planting a church that grows and bears fruit and sees a harvest, Lord. Would you do this in Beacon Church? We want to see a harvest. As Luke 10 verse 2 says, we obey the words of Jesus who commanded us to pray to the Lord of the harvest that you would send out workers for the harvest. And Father, we ask for workers. We ask for Christians who work. There is no calling, no purpose, no career, no agenda, no mission on earth more important than this. That we would be the believers who do the work you've called us to do, equipped by the grace, the sovereign grace that you have given to us, to each one of us. Lord, let us not remain passive. Stir us, move us, and empower us for this great work, we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.